I'm just in the blank window. Here we go. There we go. Okay, so we did all this WordNet stuff last time, and now we're going to get into named entity recognition this week. So this is kind of part two, where last week we we're really talking more about um, a semantic dictionary because we can use it to help us tag things. Okay, so tonight we're going to name entity recognition. And the worst part of this system is the building of training data. Okay. It is not a lot of fun. Let's just start with that and work our way through. So the purpose of NER tagging is to find named entities in documents. So a named entity is any kind of real world object with a proper name, like Apple okay, versus Apple the fruit. Apple is a company, so it's a real world object with a proper name. <clears throat> But it doesn't even need to be that specific. We can think about time as a named entity. Um, so my favorite thing about the time change, other than getting more sunlight, which we are not getting today in Pennsylvania, it has been raining nonstop, um, is that people can't get their standard and daylight times correct. And so I work with a, the group I work with was, all, was like, CST, I was like, CST was last month. Do you mean CDT? <laughs> like, what time do you think this meeting actually is? Right? Or you can consider it money, names of, of objects. So a named entity really could be a lot of things, but generally is thought of as some sort of proper named object. So much like tagging a part, uh, proper noun. So I know several weeks ago, somebody was like, really, does part of speech tagging matter? which is funny because I spent an hour earlier discussing with someone about how we're going to tag parts of speech in languages that don't have good taggers. Um, so it does exist. It is, it is a thing people do. But uh, named entity recognition also is an, it's important to have the proper noun part, tag for part of speech. Okay. So things like Twitter, France, which is a geopolitical entity or country, celebrity names, and so we can use things, tags like GTE, PER for person, org for organizations like Twitter. But again, these labels um, are made up. There are ones that people tend to use and have um, sort of agreed upon standards. But practically, you can use whatever you'd like. Um, unlike part of speech, where there was like a set of rules that pretty much governed <clears throat> Derp pretty much governed what they should be, right? All right. How many categories can we have? Well, we can have a whole bunch. So this is basically a, a training task that um, has, many, has many categories as you'd like. So we're going to do classification later, and this is basically a complex classification task. So in part of speech tag tagging, we had potentially 50 or plus. Um, so the brown corpus that we used for our um, taggers had 54, I think. And the pen tree bank has around 50. The universal set's only 10, which is a little bit more manageable, personally. And it's really up to us to determine the granularity of the tag. So by granularity, I just mean specificity. So how... Um, if you have way more tags, if you have 50 plus tags, you're going to have more specific sets of tags. Or if you have less of them, you're going to have more of a global categories. So um, maybe somewhere in the middle might be the best choice. It also depends on the task, like what the goal of your analysis is. So here are some of the most common tags. PER for person, LOC for location, like Boston, New York, right? So we're seeing lots of locations being thrown around right now as people are tracking things. Org for organization or business. MISC for miscellaneous. Um, some other tags include uh, NORP for nationalities, religious, or political groups. Okay. So like Democrats. Okay. Facility for buildings, airports, and highways. GRE for country or GPE for country, depends on, that might be a typo, for geopolitical entity products, 
right? Objects of food, events. And this events category makes me laugh because it has the, the strangest things in it. For examples, like hurricanes. Okay, well, hurricanes are named. Right? They give them names now. Um, battles, okay. <laughs> Wars, all right. And sporting events. <laughs> like it's like, like uh, terrible, terrible sports. So you could you could maybe separate those to you know <clears throat> create three separate event kind of categories if you wanted. Because those are weird things, I think, to put together, personally. But they all have names, like the Super Bowl, that kind of thing. Work of art for songs, books, paintings. Law for named laws. Um, so, if you've been watching that Waco show on Netflix, I'm from Texas. So it's kind of a weird thing to watch. But the first law that comes up to mind is uh, Brady, right? It's about guns. Um, but we have lots of named laws that you could use, and they also have these very boring numbers. So if you were looking through legal documents, you could find those and tag them. Language for languages, and numbers, uh, lots of different types of numbers. And then this can be very useful for um, tracking down, let's say you're trying to scrape websites for uh, money, for um, prices, right, you could use this numbers category to help tag prices or time. Um, you could be tracking stocks, this could be really interesting, right? And so Spacey has built in about 18 different tags that they use to classify. So we're going to start by looking at what Spacey does automatically and then look into what we can do if we have the time and effort to write our own. So we haven't yet learn how to program our own spacey model. This is where we're going to start and we're going to try. So why should we use any R tag? Like what is the purpose? What, is, what do people use this for? Okay, so this allows us to entity link. So what are the relationships between objects in a text? Because much of text analytics or natural language processing is finding ways to take text and to turn it into what we, the answer we want without actually reading it. So if your interest is understanding, let's say, political documents, because Harvard just released this like amazingly huge political document data set um, <clears throat> just this week, I think. And so that would be impossible to read. And so we could use it to help find the relationships. Who's talking to each other on Congress's floor? Which part, you know, in Parliament, like how are they linking two events to each other? Um, so, for example, Rome is the capital of Italy. We could link Rome and Italy. So it's not just because they're in the same sentence, but because we um, use this entity recognition to know that they have this relationship. <clears throat> Next week, we're going to start dependency parsing, and this will these two chapters kind of bleed together because they're not totally separable, but they do have different um, goals usually. So both Rome and Italy would get tagged as geopolitical entity, and we could link those two together. Business might use this to help identify links between organizations. Well, who's dealing and who's wheeling and dealing with who? Right. Um, <clears throat> which companies uh, look like they're being bought by other companies, or? Um, which companies interact with each other on Twitter. And that's a little different. You can see that directly through Twitter's at you know, tags. But, you know, having that understanding of the relationship between objects is interesting. All right. So the problem I have with NER taggers, not I have, the problem of NER taggers is they're often considered brittle. Brittle models are one that only work for the task that they are trained for, and they aren't flexible to new data sets. Okay, I don't expect a part of speech tagger to suddenly start giving me NER tags. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that the NER tagger that we built will only work on the things that we have trained it on. And so you either have to have exceptionally large data sets, or you have to know that anytime your model encounters new things, you're going to have to first train it. And so we can get kind of a broad 
spectrum of this stuff using Spacey's default. But if we wanted specific thing to look for specific things, um, we would have to train our own. And then it would only work for that. And so to me, this is the biggest limitation. Part of speech tagging tends to generalize from one data set to another because the language itself isn't totally changing. It might run into new words, uh, maybe some new weird structures, but generally it's pretty much subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, right? Um, <clears throat> NER tagging is tied heavily to the things it sees. And as you'll see here in our little bitty baby example that we're going to do, the uh, results are variable, okay, even using kind of the state of the art systems. Um, what else was going to add to this? It's also a pain to train. So a lot of times students are left feeling like, I don't know why anybody would do this, but I think if your company had a specific goal, you would slowly build a data set that you could use to kind of, like, kind of continuously update and train your model. So getting started would be awful, um, but maintaining would be less awful, I would think. Uh, all right, so I've already said this. Part of speech training is fairly consistent. Any R taggers will break pretty easily because they're recognized to uh, train, I'm sorry, to recognize specific context. And, you know, the way that Spacey has you do this is a little awkward. We're going to hand write some examples for this. I think there's probably a better way um, to take a larger data set and run some regular expressions through it. I mean, you'd have to know what you're looking for, but there's probably a way to systematically pipeline this where you could take a large data set, look for specific words, mark them using some, audit, some Python, and then um, shape it into this format we're about to see. Um, we're not gonna do that because <laughs> it would probably be a lot of work. And I'm trying to do this in like slow increments and not just be like, here's like 85 pounds of Python. But um, I would say that there are probably ways to, to create a, a, a workflow that takes me from data cleaning to building train da training data and out. Um, mostly here, I'm going to show you like, here's the structure the training data has to be in. And it's unfortunate. All right, so the models like that Spacey has are trained in the same way that a part of speech tagger is trained. Okay. Except that what we did in this last um, chapter is we used data sets that were tagged with part of speech. Now we have to have data sets that are tagged with entities. That is a little harder to find. And um, I would say that tends to be company specific. So the one that Spacey has, I think it's just kind of built as a global thing and is not meant for any specific task, so, so to speak. So what you could do is start with Spacey's baseline and then add your own pieces to it. Um, now, the part of speech tagging we did last week was focused mainly on um, using a unigram tagger that learns the, the sort of the rules or a bigram tagger and there are other naive Bayes tagging and all this kind of stuff. But Spacey itself is a neural net model. And we'll get to those at the end of the semester. So it is a, um, I, I don't remember actually if it's a simple or a, uh, if it's a, Simple neural net with one hidden layer or, or a deep neural net with multiple layers. But I'm not entirely sure they tell you. It incorporates with all these models. So they do have support for 55 languages until you actually dig deep down into it and then maybe not so much. <laughs> uh, okay, it doesn't quite say what they are. I'd have to read some more, but I know it's a neural net model. I don't remember how complex the neural net model is. If you have no idea what those are, you will at the end of the semester. So <clears throat> what could we use to help us determine what objects we want to classify? 
Well, obviously we can look things up. There's a dictionary of famous places and names, and we could think about anything that's capitalized because that's often a good clue. Except that, you know, dates are not always capitalized. I mean, I guess months are, but it depends on how people write it, so that's a problem. Um, the limitation there is that the dictionary was gonna would probably be quite large, and it's static. So if all you're trying to do is find um, objects like city names, the better way to do that probably is just to look for prop, for cap, proper capitalization. I mean, the, the name is capitalized because you would probably catch a lot more and better without having to constantly update based on you know new whatever. Um, so what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at here is that we could create a dictionary of named entities to look for, but then we're not really training a model. We're just training a regular expression. Look for this exact expression, and um, that dictionary would have to be constantly updated as new things were added. Right? Now, if you're going to build your own model, that's true. You're going to have to update as new things exist. So what other things we could do? Well, we could look for words around a target word. Um, we could look for prefixes and suffixes uh, to help us find the objects that we're looking for and special symbols. So like I said, most of these objects, a lot of these objects are proper capitalized, like the Super Bowl, right? So that's a good clue. We could look for, um, Let's say we're trying to find um, stock names. Well, those have a specific formatting that we could look for, right? They're three-digit codes. And then, I'm trying to think. That totally nap of brain is still happening. But, like, you're essentially trying to find the patterns that tend to occur around proper names that you're looking for. Uh, uppercase words and all of these are features that we could use as our as our training data set all right once we figure out those features which generally kind of starts as a list a dictionary list and then morphs into a set of rules we can basically turn this into a machine learning task and I'm not yet convinced that what Spacey offers is better than a, um, you know, a traditional logistic regression kind of task. But what I want to do is show you guys multiple ways to attack the same problem. So if your goal is named entity recognition, you can do automatic spacey tagging, see how that goes. You can train your own model this way with the tagger as we're going to do, or three chapters from now, you can do a regular classification task. So I feel like it helps if you know, like, here are the, the NER tagger options that are possible, but that one is going to be too much work for us. So let's try this other one first. Okay. So a really popular algorithm for this, if you're not going to use Spacey, is conditional random fields. And I know almost nothing about it, so, but it is one of the more popular algorithms. So very traditional re uh, stuff, if you get into reading about named entity recognition, is to do what's called chunking. Right? It's the most unfortunate name. <laughs> and that name actually um, is, a is a little left over from some research in cognitive psychology in my own field, where it's this idea that we, as we're reading, create these chunks of text. Um, and then after we're done reading them, we consolidate them into meaning. So there, uh, generally people suggest starting by chunking, and that's often IOB tagging. And so this um, bleeds into dependency parsing, which also requires some chunking. But by creating these little chunks, we can find maybe the specific uh, entity we're looking for. Okay. So IOB tagging is um, inside, outside, and beginning. Okay. I don't know why it's not called boy beginning inside outside but I don't know it's called IOB tagging <laughs> so sometimes you'll see people listed as boy because that makes more sense but <clears throat> we're often really interested in noun phrases okay? because named entities are pretty much always nouns 
And so that's really handy until you remember that nouns are the most popular, popular, most frequent part of speech. So, you know, knowing that something is a noun only gets you so far. And so we might look for noun phrases, and next week we'll talk about how to find just noun phrases all by themselves and not uh, or, you know, regardless of entity task, but we can look for a noun phrase and tag it. Here's the beginning of that phrase. Words that are inside that noun phrase are tagged with an I, and words that are outside of that chunk and are not necessary for our, for our, our current task are listed with an O. So we're tagging things by creating these little sub-sentence structures that maybe have the words we're looking for. And why, people often ask, well, why not just do like beginning and end? Well, this system creates what's called a flat file structure where every word has a tag. If you had just beginning and end, you, wouldn't, um, you would often lose the words in the middle. And so here what we've got is um, every single word in our chunk that we're interested in has a tag. Here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end. So every entry has a code. The I's are important as well. An update to this is uh, L and U tags. So we could use beginning, inside, last, instead of outside, which is a little bit more um, intuitive, I think. Unit, which is like the token is that only thing. And then O, which is a non-entity token. And this one makes a lot more sense to me because we have beginning, inside, end. Outside means completely ignore. A U means it's a one unit piece. So if I said, I kicked the ball, I am a noun phrase. <laughs> uh, we'll see this more next week. Or not next week because graduation, but the week after. Um, that would be a, an entire noun phrase. It's just one word. So then... In the old system, it would get tagged as a D. So we get kind of stuck with just one word because it is the beginning um, and the end. So this new system at least has some better markers. There's also a very famous one called the Stanford Named Entity Recognition Tiger. Um, it's available in NLTK, but as everyone loves Java. It requires figuring out the Java files, setting up Java correctly, and then some witchcraft, I think, to make it work. I've had a lot of trouble with it, and so I don't really teach it because it's a pain um, because of the connection between um, having to do stuff in either R or Python and then also integrate with Java, which we've already seen this semester can be problematic. So FYI is a thing, is pretty popular. Um, I would say it's slowly going out of style because it's Java. Okay. Uh, but it's a conditional random field algorithm that uses this pattern recognition to learn patterns. So it is doing a machine learning type task. <clears throat> So let's start with the default spacey and then look at how to train our own. So don't forget, you have to always import the package or load the package and then um, so load the library and then also load which language model you're working with. Now one thing to note about spacey is it has a set of pre-built models. So when they're listed here, these are models that have all of the components that we're going to go through. So part of speech tagging, NER tagging, lemmas, dependency parsing, and some other stuff I've forgotten. That means they have them all. But they also have a setup for other languages. So I've lost where the other ones were. Boop, boop, boop. Where they train them, gold name, name, name. Okay, so they also have some other languages that are available to do stuff in, but maybe they don't do everything. So they don't have them as like a downloadable model, but you can still use them to do stuff. Things that I learned today. 
because we we're wanting to do some part of speech tagging in Chinese. <laughs> And that is difficult. So I was like, why don't why don't they have one of the most like I know there are different forms of Chinese, but I'm like, why don't they have that? It's one of the most spoken languages in existence, <laughs> and they do. They just don't have it built in the same way. So there are more models such as this. FYI. Um, all right. So we've loaded English, and we've called our processor NLP. So here what we want to do is process these sentences. Okay. And so I think, I think I just like grabbed these from Twitter. Okay. Um, or they were from the example on Spacey, whatever. So Donald Trump visited government headquarters in France today. Obviously, this is old. And then here's some, he studies philosophy at, here's an entity, the university name. I guess one consider the degree and a specific type of entity if you wanted to, right? And then a graduate from the National School Administration. Right? So we would tell it to process our our text here. Then what we could do is tell it to print. So this is automatic spacey. This is like really boring. <laughs> Sorry, I'm um, distracted by all the wind. So this is the automatic stuff that Spacey does for us in English. Okay. So for each word in our first example, we're going to print out the text, the original word form, and this is how you print out the automatic piece, a okay, .int type. And so with Spacey, remember .pos might be part of speech tagging, um, .lemma for the root word, and then there's another one that I have forgotten. But uh, generally the tags that it adds end in an underscore. All right, so let's see what it did. So we got Donald Trump tags this person, 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 cool, cool, cool. France, the geopolitical entity, and today, something you wouldn't have thought of, tagged as a date. That one seems pretty easy. Let's look at the other one. And notice the empty spaces. So it will draw, essentially does, adds no tags to the words that um, don't have them. But if you wanted the chunking, those B-I-L-U tags, uh, L-O-U, uh, you could add that as one more piece to print out. So it is still doing that in the background, but I told it to just show me the entity type. All right. So it got this one as an organization. Interestingly, it tagged the whole chunk here as an organization. So I, this is where chunking becomes important. So a master's of public affairs at Sciences Po, right? It's the, the interesting part is that we're interested in the, the degree title, but it also grabs the other words involved, which is not a terrible thing because that's one whole like unit. Now, it did tag a coal as a product, which is kind of interesting and probably not correct, but it tagged the abbreviation as an organization, and this is the organization's name, so, you know, it's a good guess. And 2004 is a date. So, not perfect. Does seem to grab a lot of things that we're interested in, and you can kind of play around with its limits. Um, it does tend to grab... Um, political figures names pretty well, so they must have some data set that has that underneath. So to train your own, you can start with the English module if you want, but instead we're going to start by building an empty model. Okay. Um, I, you can do this in a bunch of different ways, but this is like the examples that they give on their site. Now I think it would be better if we started with English and then tagged added more stuff to it, but we're going to start by building a blank model so that um, we're, only we're only training one piece. So it's cool about these models is that break, it's one giant architecture, so space is not really a model, it's, uh, it's an architecture, a way of, of building a system that learns to do these tasks. And um, 
what we can do is target one of those tasks. So it has built into it, like I can do named entity recognition, I can do dependency parsing, I can do part of speech tagging, blah, blah, blah. And we're gonna tell it, well, build me a blank model and we're only gonna focus on NER. We don't wanna deal with the rest. I think they probably work together better in tandem, but let's just start small, okay? Because in a minute you'll see why that's important. So we start with a blank model. So we're gonna start here and just do spacey.blank instead of spacey.load. And we're gonna start by saying, give me English. The next thing you're gonna say is like, I'm gonna add some vocabulary vectors. So this is just an example model training. And this basically tells it kind of where we're going, like what kind of model we want to build. And here's where this, um, the, tu the tutorials I'm giving you, here's where I got them from. So you can read more about it if you're interested. So spacey models are built on pipes, and they're called pipelines, which I think is just one of these like beautiful catchphrases that um, hopefully dies soon. Just like I, I think this big data is a phrase that dies, I won't be upset. Um, this is one of those things that means that is like instantly recognizable, but doesn't mean a, the same thing to lots of people. So this idea of pipelines, because um, I think like factory worker line was not a something they wanted to say, but the idea is that you're building like steps, but they called them pipes. So we're going to add and we're going to create a pipe called NER. NLP here is the model, so we're adding a pipe to it, an NER pipe. So we built one and now we've added it to the model. <clears throat> so you create a pipe and the thing that goes in here is tied to what kind of system you want. So POS for part of speech tagging, I think DEP for dependency, um, so there's a couple of pipes that you can add, but then you do have to add it. Okay, you can call it whatever you want, but calling it NER made sense to me. So we've added it to our blank model. Still has not learned anything. Here's the sucky part. So I've been telling you how bad the uh, training data looks. It is a list of tuples, tupled dictionaries. So it actually combines all the different types of objects that one can have in Python base objects in a not so pleasant way. So let's talk about this. I'm going to give you a small example here. You're going to do some of, of your own. And it's a list of tuples that contain dictionaries. So if you need a reminder, the square brackets are for lists. The normal parentheses are for tuples. And dictionaries are our curly brackets. And the U here indicates that it is a Unicode. All right, so let's look at this. I did a lot of spacing. You don't need to do this spacing. I just tried to show you like, here's the structure of this because otherwise it's easy to miss a comma. It's easy to miss a close something. Okay. So we're gonna start our list here and I've got two sentences and we have to end our list. So that's the start and the end of the entire training data set. Next, what we get is a tuple. So every sentence, usually these are sentences. They don't have to be sentences. You could do longer document pieces, but I personally think it works best on sentences because that's usually considered the proper chunk of text. But you don't have to make it sentences. This just gets more complicated if you do. So we start as tuple. So every tuple set is a training piece. All right. Inside the tuple, the first thing that goes is the text itself. So these are just names of books in this example. Um, so the first thing that happens is the text. So here's the second one. Then after the text, the next argument. So the tuple has two arguments. It's the text and then a dictionary. So text, dictionary. Inside the dictionary, I open and close my dictionary piece. Remember that a dictionary is a set of key value pairs. Inside that dictionary, the key is always entities. So this part doesn't change. Don't change that. The values are the list 
of entities in that sentence. Right. So this one has two, this one only has one, as our training set. So far, none of this is too hard. I could structure this pretty easily by writing some code that loops through data sets and builds it into this fancy format until you hit this point. This, to me, is the point that sucks. Right. So what this is, is not the... Mm, since this searches through sentences as larger chunks, it's looking as if this sentence is one large character set. What I'm trying to say here is that it does not par uh, b -b 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 tokenize first. And maybe they have a system for doing this, because this to me is not the most meaningful way to do this. But it doesn't tokenize. And so because it doesn't tokenize, we have to tell it where in the sentence or the characters that the object is. Okay. So the numbers here represent character number. So this, it would be nice because it'd be like one, two, three, four, five, six, right? You could count the number of words. That's not how this works. It is the character on which that chunk starts, okay. and then the character on which that chunk ends, so to speak. So what 58 through 74 is grabbing is this person's name. So start of the pattern, end of the pattern, and then what tag you want to give that pattern. And to me, that's the hard part. So if I were to do this and not do this by hand, what I would probably do is have the list, have a data set that I created a frequency set for and picked all of the words I wanted to tag and then found uh, using regular expressions re.re, .re, the re function that we learned a while back, and have it tag all of this, like write some sort of code set that converts it into this format. Because obviously doing this by hand is not useful past doing a small assignment, um, but building this set is definitely, building a training set is the slow part. <clears throat> All right, uh, which is, it's sort of interesting that it uh, pulls the information this way. Instead of by word, it pulls it by character. So let's look at this one. We've got introduction to Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is a tech piece, so we've labeled it as tech, right? We can make up our own tech here, and Radu being the person here on the end. So it is a list of tuples with dictionaries. Dictionaries that include more lists with tuples. It's a lot of embedded work. All right. So far, we have built a blank model, added it in an ER tagger, built some training data. Now, we're going to tell our model what type of tags to expect. Okay. You should expect to see a person tag and a tech tag. Now, NLP is the name of the model that we've built here. These stay. Entities are add label, so be sure you keep that part the same. You can call your model Swiss cheese if you want, but you got to leave the entity dot add label as, as that. Next week, uh, not next week, but in the next section, I'll show you how to do this um, in a looping pattern a little bit more automatically. But right now, we're just going to, again, small chunks, um, add them manually. Now let's start training. So we're going to tell it to begin training, and we call this our optimizer. So start training. I've imported the random library to shuffle my data set, and we're going to run training. So we're going to run uh, 20 training loops. We're going to shuffle the training data, and then train it. Okay, now this is a little weird because our training data is only two examples, but we're going to take test. We're bleh, bleh. We're going to teach our model on those two examples 20 times. And this is pretty normal for, for these types of uh, neural net models to show them the data in epics. We'll do that next time um, to show them like pieces of the data and then show them the same examples again. Because if you think about the way that humans work, 
we have lots of training examples. We see the same things over and over again, and that helps us learn. Um, one instance learning is, is usually left to things that are very scary or things that are very delicious. And so um, it's not that unusual to teach it on the same things over and over again. However, there does there's a point in which you reach that you should stop, <laughs> right? You don't want to overtrain a model <clears throat> where um, it has only learned that data set. So what you're wanting to do is to pick to show enough examples that it gets the idea, but isn't the only thing that it's learned, where it can't generalize to other examples. Now, this model with two examples is not going to be very good, clearly, but um, I'll show you later like how you can find the spot in which to kind of stop training. Uh, but we're not, again, we're doing this in small chunks, not everything at once. So we're going to shuffle the data set. Uh, for every text and annotation, so why is it text and annotations? Because it is a set of tuples, so we're going to loop over these tuples where we have the text and the annotations, and it's expecting that annotation to be a dictionary. Where if, so if you're missing a comma or something, it's going to be unhappy. And so for every text piece and its dictionary, <clears throat> update the model. This is where the training happens. So update the model. Here's my text, here's my annotations, and my optimizer. So basically train. So here's where you actually tell it to use its training system. All right, you run that. And then in the next section, we'll tell it how to print stuff out so that you can do some judgment on like, oh, we should stop training, or oh, we should keep going, that kind of thing. You can save these models. That's really useful for super large data sets that you want to run and, um, and, and how, how do I explain this? So let's say you're trying to do a really big model and you want to train it in little mini epics. So like learn 10 things at a time and we're going to shuffle and we're going to keep showing you 10 things at a time to find that spot where you should stop. Well, you know, you also have other things to do during your day. So you're going to tell it to run overnight, but if it crashes, you don't want to lose everything. So you can tell it to write out every, you know, every 10 epics, write out a model, and I'll find the best one later when it's done. So this is how you write models. You write to disk. This will put it in a folder called model. And then you can import those models later. So let's see, did this work? Well, sort of. Okay, so my uh, example here is a tweet about, um, this person who wrote the original book talking about Elasticsearch, which was in the second example. And so it should, if it runs well, grab the person's name and Elasticsearch, because those were both things that we told it to find. And we say, okay, well, we've processed this with our new empty model. And we say, okay, print those out. So print out the label and the text. And um, what we've learned here is that it grabbed the person just fine, but also decided that this dash was a person for some reason, unclear, and it totally missed Elasticsearch. If you run these sets of notes on your own computer, you might get a different answer because it is training, it is learning. It's going to learn in a different way. The weights are going to be different. It's going to pick up different things, even though this is only two examples. Um, sometimes I, when I run these notes, get blanks. It doesn't do, show me anything. And then sometimes when I run these notes, I get Elasticsearch to work correctly. So it just kind of depends on what run it is. But, you know, it's learned a little bit. Now, if I only had four things I was looking for, I would just use regular expressions. <laughs> but this is not a very efficient system if you have a lot of things you're looking for, but, I'm, I'm sorry, a small number of things that you're looking for. These really shine when added to what we're going to do next. Okay. So these are very useful when also paired with dependency parsing. So kind of like hold on to this idea of like I can find the entities in a document and then with dependency parsing I can tell how they're linked together. So let's do a summary. So last week we talked about WordNet. And we learned about how it's a hierarchical dictionary, 
and um, we could do all this cool stuff with WordNet. WordNet seems like a very different lecture than what we just did. Here's the cool thing. We can use pieces of WordNet right, to help us build these NER dictionaries because WordNet has a lot of these kind of proper things in them. Um, and globally, this entire chapter is more about semantics because entity recognition is a problem of semantics. How do I find the proper nouns? Um, we also looked at how words are related to each other, calculating similarity, and then that's going to bleed over into next lectures because the entire purpose of dependency parsing is understanding how things are related to each other, but not similarity-wise anymore, like how they're tied to each other in the sentence. So let's say someone gets into Google and types, where's, um, where's the Wi-Fi near me? So it can, it will process that information and find that relationship. So I want to find Wi-Fi near me. So learning how those two things are connected. I'll answer your question in just a second. It's similar part of speech tagging where we can build our own models. Um, not yet convinced <laughs> that these are worth the trouble over a regular expression, but I could be I could be convinced. Right. And then you we've just dipped our toes into the water, so we're just now learning a little bit about spacey pipelines. So next section towards the end, we'll talk more about how to customize these pipelines, how to make them more powerful, um, and, and, and uh, really getting into more automation with the pipelines. All right, so your question over here. Yeah, so can we catch names? Names with typos, ooh. That's a great question. I would say that the model would be fairly intolerant of typos. Like it would miss them unless you had training examples with typos. Because these are not, it's not doing a regular expression, right? I can write a regular expression that would capture those different forms of Trump as, as you've written. But mostly these training pieces look for the exact word match. So that's why I said I'm not completely convinced that these are quite better than writing some complicated regular expressions. Um, so in general I would say no, it won't catch these typos unless you've also trained it on typos. So that's the second question. What can we expect from a model this way? The nice thing about having this is having this paired with dependency parsing so that we can understand the, you know, grab the locations and also grab their relationship to each other. But we, at this point, we've only talked about how to grab the, not locations, the objects that we're interested in. So let's say you're trying to see, um, you know, France and Italy entered into blah, 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 agreement. Well, I could grab France and Italy. Next week, we're going to talk about how to grab also the verbs so that I can start understanding the like flow of what's happening in the text. Uh, so this goes a lot better with the next chapter. And then your third question here, will it be able to distinguish Apple from like apply? Is that a company? Or is that just an Apple typo? Oh, oh, I see. So Apple the company versus Apple the fruit. Okay. Uh, usually that is what people tout as the as why these models are so useful is that they grab the difference between proper nouns and basic nouns when they overlap so supposedly it would be able to tell the difference if you had enough examples you'd have to have examples of Apple the company and Apple the fruit though because otherwise it would always look for Apple and that's one reason why these models are pretty brittle, is they have to have those kinds of thoughts. Like I have to have a, um, a training data set that includes both of those. Um, otherwise it would only learn the one and look for Apple all the time. That's why I think I, some of the, sometimes I think these are more trouble than they're worth. <laughs> because it seems like it might be easier to use a regular machine learning model, but I think the architecture in which Spacey provides is actually quite powerful 
is just that getting this kind of data seems like a pain.